Uh, my name is Wahid Al Maladi. Um, I'm a senior product engineer at Intercom. Um, and today I'm going to be talking about the benefits of foreign software. Um, so when I went back to college to study computer science, I was a mature student. Um, I did all the things mature students do. I sat up the front of the class, uh, put my hand up, tried to answer every question, uh, shushed the kids behind me with their chap snats or whatever they were using at the time. Um, yeah, so even like computer science students thought we were nerds. Uh, this led to me having a bit of a chip on my shoulder um, and tried to show off and build uh, exciting and complex software to show how smart I was. Um, but since then, I've come around to the benefits of borrowing software. So, uh, Back a little while ago at Intercom, we had a feature called Respond Insights, and it gave uh, customers metrics about their support team, like the number of conversations they were having, um, how quickly the team was responding, and how happy customers were. And in order to uh, generate uh, this, this page, we do big, massive queries, calculate the aggregations, cache the results, and then uh, show them, display them to customers as they uh, viewed the page. But as our number of customers grew, the volume of data grew, and this put quite a bit of pressure on our databases. So, uh, as uh, that pressure grew, our, our database usage spiked, we had timeouts, um, our ops team were under quite a lot of pressure because of this. And some of them uh, still don't talk to me to this day uh, because of what we did to them at this time. Uh, but also myself and my team were also uh, under pressure because of this. And I like closing my laptop at the end of the day and not thinking about work. Uh, but this system would be like sending me angry emails in the middle of the night. Uh, looking for all my attention during the day. It was like being in a dysfunctional relationship. And like most dysfunctional relationships, it was exciting at the start. Um, but it wore thin and I was knackered after a while. So we set out to replace this system with something that was exciting for our customers, but boring for us to own. And I jumped straight in. Uh, wanted to show off how clever I was, as per usual. And I put together uh, this system design. And this was done before there was any product design or research done. And you can see we have listeners on DBs passing data into a hand-rolled artisanal ETL pipeline with queues hanging off it to load data into a fleet of Redshift clusters. I stood back, I was like, I think I'm done. I couldn't think of any more ways to show off, really. Uh, but like looking at this, it, it's nuts. It would have taken ages to build, being a nightmare to own, uh, and we would have needed to learn new technologies and it would have cost us a shit ton of money. And I personally realized I'd been repeating mistakes I'd been making previously, and I wanted to fix them this time around. So first of all, I was trying to solve a problem before I understood it. And a boring problem is a well understood problem. You can't expect to come up with a solution if you don't understand the problem. So like those mature students I was talking about earlier, um, this solution was answering questions nobody was asking. Uh, it was bloated and it came with a lot of baggage. So, I needed to realize that in order to understand this, prop this problem properly, that I'm not just an engineer, you also need to be a product manager and a designer. And this because not many problems are purely technical. So at, uh, approaching it from just a technical standpoint won't give you a, a full view of the problem in order to solve it in the simplest way. So you should feel empowered to get involved in the product discussions that are happening 
in order to build up that understanding of the problem from all the different uh, viewpoints. So once I'd done that and I'd collaborated with the PM and the designer, I'd felt like, I felt like I'd uh, understood the problem well enough to actually get back to the solution. And around this time, uh, somebody sent me on a blog post by a guy called Dan McKinley. Uh, it's called Choosing Boring Technologies. Um, and in it, he references Donald Rumsfeld. I don't go around referencing Donald Rumsfeld any, uh, much anymore. Um, and the quote says that there are known unknowns and unknown unknowns. And in this context, unknown unknowns uh, are quite time consuming to convert into known unknowns. And in the end, they can add a lot of complexity to not only your team uh, and your organization, but your company. And when you're thinking about adding a new technology to your stack, you should be able to answer five questions um, that are like, how do we deploy it? How do we manage it? How do we train people to use it? How do we recover when it fails? And then how do we develop with it locally? And for the technologies you have in your stack at the moment, you probably have really good answers for these questions already. And a lot of those answers probably came the hard way through like outages, um, uh, through as and, and such, because they were unknown unknowns and became known unknowns. So we don't want to keep answering these questions over and over because they're expensive. Now at Intercom, we use Elasticsearch quite a lot. So I decided to ask the question, can I reuse existing technology to solve the problem I'm looking at? So we did some uh, benchmarking tests between Redshift and Elasticsearch. And we found that Elasticsearch was much better suited for our use case of generating aggregations. And it was also a known quantity for us. So all those questions that I would have needed to answer for the new Redshift cluster, I already had answers to. And didn't need to spend time answering them. I could just get on with building a solution and delivering value for customers. So now, with our boring ES data store, uh, we can go back and revisit our diagram again. We can see that we don't need the Redshift cluster. We're going to use Elasticsearch. And for that, we don't need a load node. We can just have a simple writer. We decided to go with a much simpler event-based approach. And that meant we didn't have to have these listeners on the databases, which meant we could cut down our whole pipeline to this really simple diagram and system. So if you've put all this effort so far into uh, keeping things boring, you don't want to lash it all together with a lot of complex and exciting code. So for me, boring code is code that doesn't confuse me. I like this quote by Brian Kernigan. Um, and I'll summarize it as, being clever is dumb. Uh, and I came to the realization a good while ago that I'm not as clever as I like to think I am. So everything that I do now is just in an effort to not confuse myself down the road. And there's a few tactics I use for this. So first is using patterns. As human beings, we're good at recognizing patterns. Uh, and when solving a problem, you want to keep as much of your high level cognitive capacity for being creative, not remembering unnecessary things. And patterns help with that. We also don't usually work on systems on our own. So uh, using patterns means that we can easily explain to other people that we need to work on the problem with us, uh, what we're trying to do. And even after we leave the project, it's easier for people to pick it up and take ownership of it. So reuse existing patterns if they are well understood where possible. Secondly, be explicit. Indirection means that we need to use up some of that cognitive capacity to remember things. 
uh, and just remembering mappings between things. And that also leads to my third point, which is being consistent. Uh, if we need to hold mappings between what an engineer calls something to what a designer calls something to what a PM calls something, then we're using up some of that valuable space that we could be using to solve a problem. An example of this uh, on this project was we had a concept of a signal uh, which makes up part of a chart. And everybody called it the same thing, front end, back end, design, PM. And what that means is my brain doesn't need to store this mapping anymore uh, when we're having conversations and I can uh, easily just get back to the solution. So in the end, uh, what did boring get us? So we had estimated it would take six months for that original design when it actually only took six weeks. Uh, the redshift clusters and other things within that diagram would have cost us about 70K a month to own, and it turned out to only be five. We got to have lots of engineers join us and really quickly get up to speed, and that really helped with the development time. And most importantly of all, I got a rest, and was nobody no longer being paged. Oh no, the most important thing is we got this really slick, powerful, exciting feature for our customers that they've been asking for for a long time. So in my opinion, boring gets a bad rap because of things like queuing and waiting and Ed Sheeran's music. Like even the definition of boring in the Oxford Dictionary is boring. Like I think they could have put a bit more effort into that. I think this lad really nailed it when he says, easy to understand, familiar and uneventful is what defines boring. So I think we should all get excited about boring, but not this lad. Thanks very much for listening and look forward to answering your questions on Slack. Oh, dear,